Hi everyone, this is Caitlin from Westwoodgirl.com. I hope you're having a great day. We have a big treat today. It is Jason Carter. He is from the Keto Apocalypse. He is a nurse in New York City. He's going to share everything he's learned about going from vegan to uh, keto to carnivore. So it's going to be a treat. Stay tuned. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Definitely glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So I'm sure people are going to learn a lot today. So what, how did you learn, how did you hear about carnivore and what got you started? Uh, well, I spent a few years as a vegan. Um, that actually worked out terribly for me. I lost a lot of weight, but I noticed my internal health was declining. I was very fatigued. I uh, was constantly depressed, constantly anxious. Um, wasn't able to sleep very well. Um, from there, I accidentally stumbled onto a ketogenic diet, which I tried on and off for about a year or two. Um, I quickly gained weight again, maybe about 60, 70 pounds. Um, my highest weight actually went up to about 300 pounds. Wow. Uh, then one day, uh, while I was following the ketogenic diet, I found this forum. I think it's called, it was called Zero Carb Zen. And someone wrote an article basically saying that there's pretty much no need for vegetables or fruits. And of course, I thought it was absolute nonsense. Um, then I found out about this guy named Dr. Sean Baker, and he wrote some articles about that as well. So I decided, you know what? The ketogenic diet that I was on, I was pretty much eating beef, eggs, avocado, maybe some spinach here and there. So I was almost a carnivore with the exception of those two ingredients. So I decided, you know what, let me just remove the spinach and avocado and see what happens. And that was kind of the beginning of my journey now. Okay, so why do you think you gained weight on keto? Oh, uh, well, I, I didn't gain weight on keto. I gained weight on the vegan okay. and vegetarian diet. Okay. Um, so I actually started out doing a juice fast where I lost about 86 pounds. Um, then after that, I transitioned into a full-blown vegan diet. And I was eating all of the whole grains or fruits and veggies, and I quickly shot up in weight. Um, even no matter how much I exercise, I would go on a treadmill or elliptical maybe five, six times a week, and I was still packing on weight no matter what I did. Um, from there, I decided to go into a keto diet, and then I lost weight. But I was still addicted to carbs. I was still addicted to having cheat meals. Um, I would make all types of justifications to have pizza and bread and the typical fast foods that we all loved. Uh, so I gained 60 pounds doing that. Um, then eventually I decided, you know what, let me get back on this keto, uh, ketogenic diet and take it seriously. Um, maybe about a year into that is when I found carnivore. So it was mostly the vegan diet, vegetarian diet, and following your typical sad diet that made me gain a lot of weight. Yeah, I mean, I've been there. Um, so what what was your, I mean, what was your health issues in the beginning like? What made you even investigate vegan or anything? So I was uh, very obese. I was 300 pounds. Um, wasn't a diabetic, thankfully. Um, I had some, problem, um, some arthritic pain in my knees, arthritic pain in my left shoulder. Um, I had insomnia. I was always depressed, always irritable, um, always anxious, um, very short of breath to just to do simple things like tying my shoes. Um, I didn't have any specific medical diagnosis, diagnoses per se, um, but I just felt horrible inside. And I knew in my early 20s, there's no reason why I should be in that state of health. Yeah. Uh, upon adopting a carnivore diet, I noticed a remission of almost all of those symptoms. Um, so it's been a, a tremendous benefit for me. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I think people accept uh, poor health too easily. And they, they, they say, oh, I'm just getting older. And I mean, I had a friend over yesterday and she was like, well, I'm, you know, 47. And I was like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, that's what they want you to think, you know. Um, so... Now, growing up, did you grow up here or a combination of? Yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised in New York City. Okay. And um, 
did now when you went to school was it hard for you to maintain your energy and stuff while you were studying and absolutely if if you speak to any nursing student they'll tell you once you join nursing school your entire life is engulfed by nursing school you have no time to do anything else i was heavily addicted to caffeine constantly relying on coffee uh energy supplements monster energy drinks like i bet junk food too right yeah oh yeah constant especially nursing students all of the food that they serve in the college cafeterias is just pure junk food it has no nutritional value whatsoever and it's like like um a hey. It's like a, you're supposed to be learning about health and helping people to be healthy, but yeah. you're eating like, right, you know, hot pockets and big gulps. And right, stuff. <laughs> exactly. And then what they teach us in nursing school, I mean, we spent, out of four years of nursing school, we spent maybe two days max learning about nutritional science. And even that nutritional science is completely outdated. You know, they tell us to eat your 30, 25, 30 grams of fiber. They tell us to eat eight to 12 uh, servings of whole grains, uh, four to six or six to eight servings of fruits and vegetables. So, you know, not only are they spending a very little portion of your curriculum teaching you nutritional science, that nutritional science is outdated. So by the time you come out, you, you, you come out with this idea of something that is completely false, completely false. And it wasn't until I adopted a ketogenic diet that I realized Everything that I had been taught in nursing school or everything that I thought I knew about nutrition was completely the opposite. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a big aha moment for a lot of people. Right. Like everything that I ever thought, especially, I mean, with carnivore, vegetables, I mean, I was, I went to, I went to holistic nutrition school, which, you know, has a, some things better, like mm -hmm. at least they teach you about eating like good fats and stuff mm -hmm. but the the idea was just more vegetables is better the more vegetables right. is better and i just could not even when i did keto i had a hard time cutting the vegetables down because i was like but they're so good they're so good for me uh. right <laughs> right and um, it, it took me a while to undo the conditioning because i had the same difficulties as you when I decided to transition from keto to carnivore and I gave up the avocado, spinach, onions, and things like that, still in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man, like, I hope something bad doesn't happen to me. Like, I'm not getting my vitamin A, I'm not getting my zinc, I'm not getting my potassium, because I, I hadn't understood yet the, the nutritional value in meat. The only concept of meat that I understood was that meat is for protein, and that's it. I knew nothing else. Yeah, that that's what they teach you and then like and then too much is gonna you know ruin your kidneys or whatever right right, right. and and that yeah it's the only thing in meat is protein and right. but, but you could get that from beans sure right i was told i i remember this profoundly i i was told in nursing school that macaroni and cheese is considered a complete protein meal oh yeah but that gives you an idea of you know what we were taught in nursing school well, I'm from the South, so macaroni and cheese is a vegetable. Too. Right. <laughs> it's the superfood of all of all superfoods. Um, okay, so you know now you've been carnivore. What? How long? Uh, this month will make actually three years. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. Now, do you get grief from your peers and stuff? All the time. All the time, especially my coworkers. Yeah. They, they've been waiting two years now for me to have a stroke or a heart attack of some sort. And then my, but they're the ones getting diagnosed with diabetes or right. high, high blood right. pressure or, right. um, or gaining 100 pounds or whatever. Right. I see it all the time because, you know, we're all healthcare professionals and I usually don't eat at work. Or if I do, they'll see I have like maybe like a boneless cheeseburger and, you know, they'll make fun of me like, oh, you're going to have a stroke. Your arteries must be clogging but then the very next morning they're bringing in boxes and boxes of donuts oh yeah juice and i'm just like do you like are you not making a correlation but yeah it's gonna take them some time to come around but if you ate a bun on your cheeseburger you would be normal right exactly exactly <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> you have it with a fork, you're a weirdo. Right. <laughs> like, okay, just put some more carbs on it, and then it would be fine. Right. <laughs> I and told them, I said, I eat everything that you eat. I just leave the, the, the side dishes out of it. Yeah. I eat the same steak as you. I just leave the potato to the side. I leave the corn to the side. Otherwise, it's, it's, I'm not doing anything that much different. No. But I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Like, do they notice that you used to be bigger and that you're in better shape now? And don't they say, how do you do that? Right. Yeah. And when I when I show them, I actually so, show some of them my Instagram and they, up until this day, they still don't believe me. They <laughs> think I'm lying. I show them videos of me eating the food. They see me get the, the boneless cheeseburgers. I'll even tell the uh, cafeteria men to put extra butter on it. They see me eating it. And they're unable to grasp the idea that eating this way is what's causing me to look the way I do now. They, 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 doing, like, they probably think you're doing like six hours of cardio when you get off work. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, no, exactly. that's not it. <laughs> um, but you do. So what are some of your special takes on carnivore? I know you've adjusted quite a bit from when, you know, you started. And we all do. I think it's important to kind of start with the basics. I mean, tell me if you agree. Start with the basics of what the old school people teach. Right. And then kind of, and don't get too bogged down in worrying about macros and everything because you'll just get overwhelmed. And right. then later you can adjust to your personal, what you find works with your body. So what did, tell us your trend, your like progression there. Mm -hmm. Well, when I first started, um, I remember everyone that I saw online, they pretty much said, eat your meat, eat your water, and you'll be fine. That'll take care of everything. Eat your ribeye, eat your water, and you'll be fine. So that's what I did. I ate maybe, I was eating probably two, three, sometimes even four pounds of beef in a day. I was drinking water. I was making sure I was getting my electrolytes in, but I was just pounding the meat all day. And it helped her to a certain extent. I started losing weight. I also started incorporating fasting with that. But I realized because of my many years of following a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, and then a sad diet, I had developed, or at least I believe I developed what's called a leaky gut. And when you have a leaky gut, you can't just throw in three or four pounds of meat into your stomach and think, you know, that's going to heal everything. I was actually causing more harm than good. Also, what I noticed is I was on this carnivore diet eating a lot of meat. However, I was still heavily reliant on caffeine products. And I had to reach a point where I, was, I said to myself, you know, if this carnivore diet is so good, if I'm getting the nutrition, uh, nutrients I'm supposed to get from these foods, then why do I still rely on caffeine to get me through the day? Why am I still having trouble sleeping? Why am I developing all, all of these food uh, sensitivities and food allergies? Um, so then I started looking into a higher fat approach to carnivore, and so far it's been helping me tremendously. Um, one thing that I notice is when I'm eating so much protein, I never really get the chance to keto adapt because I'm, my body's just taking that extra protein and converting it into glucose. And I would go to the gym three or four times a week, but still I noticed my blood sugars was always in the 90s. And by Mainstream medical standards, that's not bad. That's actually within normal range. But ideally, your fasting blood glucose should be in the 70s. And I was never able to reach that. My ketones were always around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which is kind of on the cusp of nutritional ketosis, but not quite there. So I found I was in this gray area between being a sugar burner and being a fat burner. And I think that just wreaks havoc on the body. If you do that for too long, you can start to develop, you know, some discrepancies. Of course, this is based on your own medical history as well. Um, so as of recently, I've been adopting a higher fat approach to carnivore. And my blood sugar is much more stable. It's typically in the low 80s. And my ketones range anywhere from 2.2 to sometimes 3.6. Wow. Um, no longer drinking caffeine or, or any other, you know, uh, pre-workout supplements. I have sustained energy throughout the day. My circadian rhythms are coming back on track. Um, so at least for me, I believe a high fat approach is the best for me. Now, some people can tolerate a more high protein approach. I 
personally prefer a high fat approach to carnivore. So does that mean how much like grams or percentage or, you know? Yeah, so uh, people that follow the high fat approach, they typically recommend at least 80% of your calories coming from fat and the other 20 uh, coming from protein. Recently, I've been averaging around 85% to maybe 92% fat and the rest from protein. Um, What I was concerned about initially is the weight gain. Because when you're, I was eating a lot of fat to teach my body, hey, use this fat to make ketones. And I was kind of like adding on the weight. But now that I'm in a deep state of ketosis, now I find my body is just burning the fat off because now it knows how to use fat for energy. Okay, so how do you get up? Well, so that's your percentage. And then, um, so how do you get up to that percentage? Because I know a lot of people, I mean, it's hard to get that much fat in your mm-hmm. mouth without just like drinking butter or something. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, like you said, I eat a lot of butter. Okay. A lot of butter. <laughs> Uh, a lot of butter. I also eat fat trimmings, so like grass-fed fat trimmings. I'll either eat it raw or I'll put it in the air fryer for a few minutes and I'll eat it like that. Or um, what else? Was what I was doing before was heavy cream, but I, I find that lactose for some reason seems to delay your, your keto conversion process, so I just cut out dairy altogether. And also pork belly is really good. Pork okay. belly has like a five to one ratio of fat to protein. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's the perfect, you know, high fat keto meal. So do you go to the butcher or something? Do you have a source for? Yeah, so there's several farms online that I order from. Uh, usually it's uh, White Oak Pastures. Um, the other one is uh, Dutch Metal Farms. And then occasionally I'll order from this other place called uh, uh, Frankie's Free Range Meats. And they have like a bunch of different, you know, exotic meats and different organs that you wouldn't be able to find at a butcher. So I like usually shop through those three places. Okay, so not, then nothing local then you haven't found? Um, occasionally I'll go to a Whole Foods or in New York City we have a, a Union Square farmer's market. Then they- yeah, I'll go there and get like some um, organs. Sometimes they have like grass-fed liver. Uh, sometimes they have like raw butter and things like that. So, and and you eat more. You are able to eat some raw stuff, right? Yes, yes. I've been eating mostly raw since January. Once in a while, I have something cooked, but I say at least 90 percent of my diet is, has been raw since January. Yeah, that's interesting. Out people always say that. They're afraid of food poisoning. What do you think about that? Uh, I have mixed feelings on that. Um, I don't believe there's such a thing as good and bad bacteria. I think what makes a bacteria bad is when there's an imbalance in the gut. Um, I, that's a fear that I had to get over when I decided to adopt raw carnivore. Even before my first piece of raw steak, like I just sat there staring at the steak. And then I just said, all right, let's just try it. And after I ate it, I just felt so much better. I, it's, it's hard to describe. I feel much calmer when I eat raw meat. Um, it, it digests much easier. I feel like I'm more hydrated. Um, I also found that I don't need as much salt. Uh, this is when I was still eating two or three pounds of meat. So I didn't, I, I was able to meet my sodium and potassium needs. Now that I'm eating less meat, I find that I need to add an exogenous source of electrolytes. So you, you, you're you saying your electrolyte need went down with the raw meat? Right, because it's, at least my understanding of it is when you're eating meat in its raw form, you're not cooking out the sodium and potassium. I and see. I was still eating two or three pounds of meat at that time. So I was fulfilling my sodium and potassium requirements uh, without the need for you know, adding salt onto my food. But now that I'm eating maybe 12 ounces of meat a day versus three or four pounds, that's not enough for me to, you know, replenish my sodium and potassium. So now I'll make like my salt water and just drink that throughout the day. Okay. Yeah, I mean, 
I think that's one big thing people always screw up is forgetting electrolytes and not taking it seriously. And then they're like, I can't sleep. And you're like, well, (laughs) every other thing, any other thing. I'm like, well, did you? And it's not just once. You take it every single day. Right, right. Oh, okay. I'll do it today. I'll be good today. And then, right. And then they're like, oh, I'm God's fate. I'm like, well, did you right. <laughs> do it every single day? You know, it's not just like once, but yeah, I mean, I think about raw food. I mean, I can, I notice I can eat things more rare than I used to. Mm-hmm. Then. So I think, you know, you could get there. I, with the food poisoning, I think I mean, it sounds like you're doing using really good sources and that would make me feel a lot better. The people always, you know, of course I'm pregnant now mm-hmm. and everybody's like, are you allowed to eat this? Are you allowed to eat this? I'm like, well, if you talk to your doctor who knows something from like 1950, like, of course they're going to say you can't have this or that. But like, I just go with my cravings. Like I had a lot of cravings for raw milk. So I drink. I drank that, then I got too like congested, <laughs> and then <laughs> I had to stop that. But um, then I, I had a craving for a while for raw fish. Do you mm. ever eat raw fish? Oh yeah, okay. raw salmon, I love it. Love yeah, it. It's one I, of my favorites. Yeah, and then, so I was eating that for a while, and I mean, I'm just I'm not gonna listen to something that's like super outdated. I mean, the fish was already frozen; it was like sashimi grade or whatever. Yeah. But, already frozen for like who knows you know it could be six months it's frozen already you know and then you just thaw it out and it's ready to go I mean or you could sear like a tuna you could sear it like for two seconds or something if you that's what they're gonna do in a restaurant you would eat it in a restaurant you wouldn't be like oh my god it looks gross right you would be like (laughs) and that's what I tell people because you know they'll see me if I go to a sushi restaurant nobody blinks an eye like it's perfectly normal but then, or in, in uh, uh, certain countries throughout the world, they each country has its own particular uh, dish of raw meat that's native to their culture. But when they see me eating raw ribeye or they see me eating raw fish, for some reason, it, it just, it, it turns them off. It deters them from the diet. But if we were anywhere else in the, in the world, this would be considered completely normal. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I ate tartar in italy i think and it had a ton of i think they mixed a bunch of like they grated garlic you could taste it was really strong garlic in it which i mean made me feel a little better it's like killing the whatever you know Mm -hmm. um but i mean it was great i ate it it was fine you know and if i knew you know i'd probably just take some practice to make your own at home i mean i'm not i haven't ever made it so but I mean, I eat raw egg yolks, no problem. Do you eat raw? Yeah. Do you eat eggs? Yeah, once in a while I have some raw, not the the white part, yeah. but I have some raw duck egg yolks um, here and there, but not on a normal normal basis. And so you eat a lot of organ meats, and you think that's giving you like an edge? Um, yes, especially with the liver. Um, the liver has the most bang for buck. I notice whenever I have liver the night before, when I wake up the following day, I always wake up feeling refreshed. I don't feel lethargic. Um, so now I try to eat two ounces of liver every day, two ounces of raw liver. I don't really like the taste of it cooked. It's just something about the taste that's just repulsive to me. But when it's raw, I can definitely tolerate it. One day I tried to freeze some in little pieces, you know, I, like I cut it up and then I put it in little, like those silicone trays. You right. know? Yeah. And then I was like, I'm just going to swallow it. And so I took, and then I got like choked on it. <laughs> and like, I really thought like, you know, you see like the stars and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this is it. This is it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going down. And I was able to get it back out. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a good like, first experience. I mean, I can eat it regular, so I'd, I'm uh, like, maybe I should just eat it normally. I don't mind it. Like, I've made pate, and I, I mean, I've been, I was doing paleo for years before I was carnivore, so okay, I was okay. always trying to eat liver in different ways. I mean, mostly cooked, but, um, and my husband is from North Africa, so in, 
in his country, we've been there several times and they, they will kill sheep on the street, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> yeah. and it's all coming out and then they eat the whole animal and they make soup out of the stomach and right. it's like a whole, you know, for, for us, for Americans, it's like, oh, right. but then, but then you see that they, you know, they're utilizing the whole animal and. Right. And then the, the, the liver is actually a delicacy. Mm -hmm. And that day, you eat it that day, right, right away, you know. And it's, I mean, I never had liver taste that good before. You know, it was wow. like really <laughs> straight wow. out of the animal, you know. Wow. So I was like, this is why people don't like liver, because they've never had it fresh, you know. Fresh, yeah. you know? It's, I, so I think it maybe starts to break down or something and gives like a off, you know, anyway. So yeah, that if you want to, I mean, that's what's so ridiculous about veganism. It's like when you go to any other country, you're like, okay, this is does. I mean, these everyone is just eating whatever they can get, you know, off. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, I went to Thailand. They were eating the bugs, and you know, yeah. like I don't know, if I can do that, yeah. but you know, yeah. it's so. I, I think a vegan diet is only possible as a result of uh, a globalized industrial market. Without that, you would not be able to get your, your coconuts from Thailand or your, your mangoes from Jamaica. Your matcha. Your, yeah, like, <laughs> there's, there's no way. Like and quinoa, I mean, and, yeah, and it would I mean, be impossible. Animals exist all over the globe throughout all types of climates. The, the, these famous, these, these uh, luxurious berries, Oh yeah. Avocados and that vegans love to eat. You you can't do that without a globalized industrial market. And refrigeration and trucking and right, all those right. things that take gasoline to to exactly make them work. You know exactly. Um, I mean, one time my sister studied in Peru and she said that all the good stuff that they have, they export it to us, and then they can't afford any of these like luxury items even right. coffee is like they drink like instant but right. like you get the good coffee from south right. america is like right. it makes no sense you know sanity so now do you think that what do you see yourself doing in the future where where do you see your diet ch changing are you gonna stick with this for a while or yeah, I think um, I think I'm gonna stick with this. Um, I want to see how my health improves over the next six months. Um, I'm actually planning on getting some blood drawn in, in December and then reporting that on social media so people can see what the results are of following a high fat carnivore diet. Um, also, at the moment, I'm in school to become a health coach, a uh, primal health coach. Oh, okay. um, so I'm, I'm hoping by next year I can start, you know, utilizing those skills and my experience to help other people the same way I help myself. I think you could already do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought I thought about that too. But nowadays, like, if you don't have a certification, you kind of lack credibility. You yeah, know, but, you're, but you're a nurse, so, so that's like way above. Be right, right, right. Most people. Right. Online. But, um, yeah, I figured I should do it, you know, just to fine tune my knowledge on nutrition. Um, and at least people can see that I have some kind of credibility with regards to health coaching. Um, Be more well rounded. Will, yeah, I think that'll give them more faith in actually, you know, following. Not, sometimes it teaches you like the method. So it's easy to do it for yourself sometimes, but trying to teach it to somebody else maybe gives you giving you like a system to follow to teach right. somebody else right and that's another thing like i understand i understand like i don't know everything about nutrition but i, I have a, a decent amount of knowledge um so it's one thing to have all of the knowledge and the experience but how do you apply that to the individual that needs to implement it in their lives and i feel like the school is you know helping me gain those skills because you can you can know everything from A to Z, but if you don't know how to coach someone, yeah, they, you, know, you don't have much value. It's almost like you're like, look at my biceps, and then yeah, right, right. Like it's like you see that person in the gym or something, but right. can they right pass that and it's, knowledge? And it's all over social media. You see the Instagram models selling the the flat tummy tea and 
I, I don't want to be one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you, you come off a lot more sincere, so I don't think you'll be like that. No. Uh, no. So let's see if we have any other questions from our <clears throat> audience here. So have you done, I mean, I feel like people jump too fast into doing blood work when they first start and then maybe they have this huge release of triglycerides or they have this huge change and then they catch it too soon before mm. their body's really regulated mm. and then they freak out. So did you do blood work before and, you know, did it get better or what? So I, I, I didn't do blood work prior to starting a carnivore diet. However, my most recent blood work was from February of this year. And the only thing that was out of range, well, at least to my doctor, was my total cholesterol. I think it was maybe 210 or something like that. It was, yeah, and he was freaking out and started recommending all of these statins. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I actually told him that I want my cholesterol to be high, that I'm actually fine with that. Then we got back and forth into a little bit of an argument. And I told him, I said, you know, your, your cholesterol can vary from day to day based on what you're eating. Your liver can produce as much cholesterol as it feels it needs to accomplish whatever functions it needs to accomplish. I told him what you should be paying attention to is my C-reactive protein. You know, that's, that's a more reliable indicator of inflammation that's going on in my body. And once I said that, he, his brain kind of went blank. And I can tell he didn't understand what I was saying to him. <laughs> so I, ju I just, I ended it there. I took my lab values and I, I left. Yeah. So um, aside from that, everything else was within range. Um, what I want to do this December is a more detailed uh, uh, lab drawing with my nutrient values, like vitamin A, C, D, so on and so forth. I definitely want to get my C-reactive protein checked um, and a few other things so that people can clearly see, all right, not only have I been on a carnivore diet for three, three and a half years by then, but I've been following, I've been eating a lot of fat for the last six months. And based on actual numbers, there's, you see no indication of heart disease or impending stroke or, you know, cardiac arrest or anything like that, or diabetes even. Yeah, and you, I mean, I think people should get, be more focused on their A1C and their triglycerides. Exactly. exactly. And their CRP and... Um, you know, if you just see one thing that's like, oh, my L LDL is high. And the other thing about the cholest total cholesterol is, I think in the 90s is when they just lowered it. It used to be 250 yeah. was fine. Yeah. But because they wanted to sell their drugs, they just changed it, made it lower. But yeah. I can't believe that he has anyone that's under 200 i mean if he was freaking out because like no almost nobody is under 200 except i mean people on statins right, <laughs> those, right. those people are on. Uh, i mean i have a family member that's on statins his total cholesterol is like 140 150 it's like that's uh, not uh, that's not that's normal not big, yeah. right. but of course you'll get this big you know right. doctor <laughs> like what right. that's artificially lowered right oh but i'm just thinking well maybe but i have got this person to be carnivore so i'm like well mm. i'm hoping that the protective effects of the meat and the fat will keep them from being killed by the statin or whatever right <laughs> that's that's actually a common question that i get about carnivores you know what about my cholesterol are you monitoring your cholesterol and your cholesterol is going to get too high should be lower and I tell people, you know, cholesterol is, is, is vital. It's a vital uh, lipoprotein, you know. It, it builds every cell in your body. It lines the, the membranes of your nervous system. Your brain is, what, I think 50, 60% fat. It's responsible for producing and regulating your sex hormones. Why in the world would I want to take something that's going to lower that? Obviously, cholesterol is... is, is essential so why would i follow a diet or take a pill that's going to lower that i can't see anything but uh dangerous adverse effects coming from that and and no one seems to grasp that 
I know one time my cholesterol was, was higher. It was like 300 or something like that. And it was when my thyroid was really off. So I think if you are, if you do have a really high number, it's probably signaling that you have something in your body that maybe is a little out of whack, but, and so your body's making more cholesterol to heal it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then as soon as I got on the right medication, it went down to like 250 <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I'm totally fine with that. And, and I think people just like you did, I bet you probably won't go back to that guy. You'll probably find somebody new. Yeah. Um, so you're the boss of your healthcare plan. You know, right, right. I think people think that they're like beholden to some doctor. Right. right. I tell people all the time, if you're not satisfied with your doctor, fire them. Fire them. You don't have to make a scene or anything, but just don't call them again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't have to be like nine to five. uh, like. (laughs) Or at least now you can go and and see a functional medicine doctor, you know, who doesn't just treat the symptoms. They actually address the root cause of the illness. And they're much more educated in nutritional science. I mean, it's challenging, but I mean, of course, probably not in New York or L.A. or all the big cities. I mean, I used to live in San Francisco for a long time, so I actually had, there was naturopathic doctors on every corner, so you mm-hmm. got, you could get help, but, um, you know, sometimes you have to pay out of pocket, and I think some people are too, they don't want to pay for anything. Right, yeah, and yeah. It's, but it's, so it's not that expensive sometimes, yeah. you know, it's like... You can, I mean, it's all about how you're going to spend your money. And if you're going to, you have a $600 car payment or, you know, however you, that's worth it, you know, right. but your right. health could be like going right. down. And, so. and I, I think the cost of preventative medicine is, in my opinion, much more affordable than spending the next 30, 40 years of your life paying for prescriptions, paying for dialysis, paying for insulin and, and, and things of that nature, surgery. So that the cost that you, if you're willing to invest it into preventing these illnesses, it, it has a much, much bigger um, ROI in the long term. Oh, and I mean, yeah, my husband's, one of his family members is on insulin and shooting that every day. I mean, mm. I can't imagine how much that would cost if, um, you know, if you didn't have really good insurance, you would be so screwed. Right, right. I can't even, it, yeah, it's a lot cheaper to be healthy, I think, in yeah. our, especially in America. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, I've had family members who had gastric bypass. I mean, you name it, and it's not cheap. None of that is cheap. Right. So, staying healthy is the best, is the best thing for your wallet. Mm. <laughs> So what do you think about, you know, working in the healthcare? How's it been, you know, with the whole, you know, the C word? Mm-hmm. Um, it's been very hectic. It's actually, it's kind of calmed down lately within the last two months, I would say. But in the bit beginning, right at the peak, it was absolute chaos. Um, but I, I have some mixed views about it about the whole pandemic thing. And what I see being reported on the news is not identical to what I see in the hospital, not just my hospital, but other hospitals throughout New York City. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm torn between my experience and what's being reported to me. Like as far as the amount of people or? Yeah, just, you know, the 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 amount of people that are being infected with it, um, the tests that are being used to diagnose this virus, and then the way the deaths are being recorded. Uh-huh. Uh, I've, I've noticed myself how someone can die of one thing and then have it labeled as Changed. <laughs> the other thing. And me being the nurse, being there when the person passed away and knowing why the person passed away, I can clearly see, okay, the person passed away because of this, not because of the C word. Right. So when I 
watch the news and I see, you know, we have this many deaths, this many died this week, or we've reached this peak. I know that some of that is not as accurate as they're making it out to be. So, so you think there's discrepancies in... Absolutely. They're just picking which thing they want to put on the paper. Absolutely. And there's a number of nurses and doctors who have come out and said, hey, you know, what we're doing here is incorrect, or why is uh, the CDC or health department forcing me to do this when our policy states that we're supposed to do that? And unfortunately, those people who come forth and say these things, they get censored or canceled in some type of way. So it's it's a very um, troubling time well, the, at the moment. I think the thing, I mean, tell me if that people don't take into account the, the comorbidities, the, the person probably has three or four or five things going on. Right. right. At the well, same you, time. You can, so here's what I noticed. You can, let's say, God forbid, you fall in the street, you crack your skull, right? You get admitted to a hospital, you, for whatever reason, you, you bleed to death, right? If you just so happen to have the symptoms of this virus, uh -huh. or if you just so happen to be positive at that time, according to the new standard, you are to be uh, documented as a death by the uh -huh. Is there when, some incentive for that? <laughs> I believe there is. I believe there is. Um, it's like like public school, you know, for every kid they have in the desk, it's five hundred dollars or whatever. Right, right. So the numbers may have changed, but my recent understanding from maybe March or April is that if you admit a patient that's diagnosed with COVID nineteen, I think you get $19,000 for that patient. If the patient is intubated as a result of that virus, you get 39,000. So I can't help but think, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go as far as to say that people are being unnecessarily intubated, but when you have all of these uh, causes of death being redocumented and, and altered, it makes me wonder why, like what, why, why? By all medical standards, we know that the person died from something else, but it's being documented as something else. What is the reason for that? What's the motive? But do you, but, but I mean, leaving that for the side for a second, do you still think, I mean, you still think it's something we should be cautious about and careful of, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. But I, I think people also need to take account, like you said, they have to take into account their comorbidities, their past medical history. Almost no one's talking about vitamin D or zinc or, or just exercise. No one's talking about that. No one's talking about strategies to improve um, your your immune health. No one's talking about that. Everything is about pharmaceutical my, interventions. My, you know, I have a, I have like four sets of parents. You know, I have a large. So I have stepmoms and you know stepdads and everything. So mm -hmm. it's like I'm always trying to tell them like do your lifestyle stuff right yeah and don't watch the news so much don't freak out all the time right and take your vitamin d take your I, I take i've been taking zinc vitamin d since it started and then um yeah i mean keep your blood sugar i'm always telling them stay low carb mm -hmm. keep doing because they all kind of do that already mm -hmm. uh I mean, for me, you know, beating them down for so long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, keep doing that. And then, you know, take your stuff and just be smart. But don't make yourself crazy, you know. Don't be so anxious <laughs> because you watch it 24 hours a day. It's like, yeah. I feel like it can become like a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Right, right. You just... I remember when... Um... We first caught news of it entering the U.S. I went to the grocery store to stock up on meats, and I'm looking around, and people are arguing and fighting. You know, uh, you know, people are arguing because you're standing too close for me, or you're not covered. And then I'm, I'm looking at their shopping carts, and their shopping carts are filled with juice, with soda, crackers. Now these are things that are supposed to sustain them over the next three to four months. And I'm thinking, like, if that's what you're doing 
then no wonder we're in the mess we're in now. Like you, you have to change that first before oh. you start worrying about some external enemy. I can't even imagine if I didn't eat the way I did or do that I would, I mean, I just had to take my blood sugar for the pregnancy, you know, mm -hmm. the glucose tolerance. And I mean, my blood sugar was, it was pretty good. Like it, it was stayed between like, uh, you know, 80 and 105 or something mm -hmm. like that, like all the time. Like I did it four times a day, but if I, and that's, but that takes extreme effort to not eat crap, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot imagine how high it would be. Oh yeah. If I, I mean, I would have failed. Yeah. I, I refuse to take that, ju the drink crap, the glucoa or whatever. I said, oh, can I just, sorry. can I just take it at home? Can mm -hmm. I just take my blood sugar at home and I'll send it to you? And they were like, okay, you know, they didn't, they didn't like it, but. Um, <laughs> I just kept saying, I, I know what I'm doing, you know, and, yeah. and they just, finally, they saw it, and they were like, okay, yeah, it's good, and, but I mean, I just can't imagine how anybody would pass that. If they ate That's sandwiches cool. and pasta and, and that kind of stuff all day, I, w I mean, my blood sugar would be 300. I can't it's, even. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It just absolutely. blows me away that, and then I can't imagine, like, I'm really sensitive, I think, because I'm like ha Hashimoto's and I have autoimmune disease and all. So I'm sensitive to things anyway. Mm -hmm. But I just can't imagine like a regular person. Like if I don't sleep one night, I'm like totally messed up, you know, like, but if I ate that stuff, I would never sleep and I would be sick all the time. I mean, I just cannot imagine how a regular person who eats a standard American diet functions. But you know what? I, I, Thought, had the same thoughts as you and I realized if you do that for long enough that becomes your normal most people have no idea how good they're really meant to feel or how how good it feels to actually be healthy if you're following that lifestyle for 10 15 years you start to adopt that as feeling normal so you don't you don't see that what you're doing is destroying your body because you've adopted that the insomnia the shortness of breath the fatigue you know relying on coffee all day that is your new normal. So I think when people come out of that and the, 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 the clouds part in their brain, they can understand like, wow, like what I thought was normal before was absolute hell. I'm not meant to feel like that. I should be feeling like this. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. They just somehow find, just find the, the every few hours, it's like sugar, caffeine, sugar, caffeine, sugar. Right. And then they just kind of, but I don't know. I mean, I, I was 240 pounds when I got out of college, mm -hmm. but I was miserable. I had knee pain. I had all this stuff already, and I was trying to wait tables, and I couldn't even, I was 21 or 22, you know, and I couldn't okay. even keep up with right. the other kids that were, okay. you know, my age. Like, they would all want to go out after. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I can't walk. <laughs> like, you know? Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's hard on your body. It's hard so, on you. I mean, I'm sure I would have diabetes and everything if I had kept up the way I was. So, um, so can people already contact you for health coaching or you want to wait till they? Um, yeah, there's been a few people who have contacted me for health coaching and we've done our sessions. Um, I normally encourage people to just, if they have any questions, feel free to shoot me a DM. You know, I'll try my best to answer within 24 hours. Um, once I get the certification, then I'll start doing the coaching more full time. Tell, um, so say it again where they can find you and everything. Oh, so you can find me at the Keto Apocalypse. That's on Instagram and on Twitter. It's uh, hashtag or handle is Keto Apocalypse. Um, just right now, I'm just on those two platforms. I'm not on YouTube yet. Oh, yeah. Well, you will be soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll put links below so you guys can DM uh, Jason. And it's been really fun talking to you. And I think you have a lot to share and offer people. So you guys follow Jason on Instagram. And um, 
We'll see you next time. Please share and subscribe and like this video so more people can see it. We can help more people. Thanks again. See you All next right, time. Bye-bye.